joining us. But it is seven o'clock on the dot, and I am one for time integrity. So I want to first of all thank all of you who are registered for registering. This is the very first episode of Calm Online, the webinar series. And we have a great conversation in store for you. We're talking today with my guest expert, Lynn Wade. And Lynn is a storyteller and a speaker, and she is passionate about changing the world one courageous conversation at a time. Lynn, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me and all of you wonderful people that have signed on. Thanks for just opening it up. Your, your time and, and, and just reserving this time to just spend it with us and just have a conversation about how we can be courageous. And thank you to Denise as well. So let's talk about what is the difference between a regular conversation and a courageous conversation. So when you talk about courageous conversations, what is it that you mean? When I talk about courageous conversations, I'm talking about a lot of the times we need courage because there's something that's not working right? It's a fear, it's rejection. There's something that makes us feel that we can't show up in our authentic self because we're afraid of presenting who we really are. So when I, the difference between a regular conversation as in, hey, how you doing? There's no depth to it. It's just about, you know, a surface sort level conversation. A courageous conversation to me is moving from a place of fear to understanding both for yourself and the person that you are having this conversation with. So what are some of the fears? I know that the fears that we might have, because we feel like we want to have that conversation. There's something we know that we would really like to say, but the heart starts pounding and all of these fears pop up. So what are some of the most common ones that you that you've experienced yourself and that you've noticed other people have? Well, I think there's a, there's a whole bunch of them, but I think really the biggest fear that we have with, each other is the fear of rejection, right? Mm -hmm. I may tell you how I feel and you shut it down because it doesn't make any sense to you. So there's always that initial fear of rejection, fear of, oh, I'm the only one that's talking about this, fear of um, just insecure, you know, and, and people not affirming who you are because sometimes we get to the point that we are because we've made all the assumptions and we've done everything and we're thinking to ourselves oh my god how am i going to do that so it's really um i would say the major is really rejection because if you would hear me we would be successful so if i didn't think you were going to reject me we would have the best conversation but i come into the conversation with an assumption that i'm going to be rejected so i think i think rejection is the biggest fear and you know what, I would totally agree with that. And as we were preparing for our conversation together today, I was thinking about a time, it was about three years ago. And my father, when we were growing up, we had very um, surfacey kind of relationships. So when we would talk on the phone, it'd be like, oh, so how's fishing? How's the weather? He'd make a joke. I'd laugh sometimes. Sometimes I wouldn't. <laughs> and then one day he said to me when I was 47 years old, he said, and it was strange because he's never said anything to me that was really real. And what he said was, he said, you know, I was always jealous of your granddad, which is my mom's dad, because you kids would crawl all over him and he would, he could always say he loves you. Mm -hmm. And so when he said that something hit me, I thought, wait a minute, that's real. But I didn't know what to do with that because that wasn't our regular pattern of relationship. So I didn't say anything. Right. And it took me two weeks and I was thinking about it. Because up until that point, I never really felt as though my dad loved me. Yes. And so now he had said, I used to be jealous of your grandfather because he could say he loved you. And I thought, if he was jealous for that reason, then maybe that means he loves me too. And I thought, Denise, you need to have a conversation because this will be very healing to you. Yes. And I'm telling you, I picked up the phone and I thought, I'm going to do it. I'm going to have this conversation. Yes. But then, boom, 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 my heart starts pounding. And I thought... I'm not going to do it. I'm going to say, uh, how's your day going? Something like this and very surfacy again. But I thought, no, you have to do it. And I just broke into tears because it's very emotional when you say what's real. And I started to cry and I said, dad, I just want to thank you for having the courage to say you were jealous of granddad. I said, because I'm 47 years old and I never felt like you loved me until now. Yeah. And by me being able to open that door, him opening it first, then me coming back in, he said, Denise, I really love you. 
Yeah. And I'm telling you, it healed this little five-year-old girl inside of me that and I was thinking, my dad loves me. Yes. And it took the courage to go beyond that heart pounding. So how, Lynn, can we do it? When we feel that moment, we feel the fear of rejection and we think we're going to chicken out and saying what we really need to say, even mm -hmm. though it could make our lives so much better. Mm -hmm. How do we, how do we do it? He, and you, I think you hit the nail right on the head there. You heard your father's story. He, he, he told you basically a sort of precursor to why you would even build on the, the fear of rejection of having the conversation by saying, I was jealous. And sometimes part of getting past the fear is going into the conversation wanting to know the other person's story. It's like in families, you know, one of the things I've always heard counselors and therapists say, do you know your mother's story? Do you know your father's story? Do you know the person you're talking to story? Because if you're just going in based on your story, then you're really not looking for a resolution in the conversation. You're looking for a confrontation. And if the conversation is not about bringing healing, then the conversation is not really worth it. So really knowing the person's story really helps you to hear, listen, and feel. Because sometimes we have this thing where we don't think it's important to feel. Fear is okay to feel when you're in that place because yeah. you know that then it's worth it, right? If it wasn't worth it, you wouldn't have been afraid. But you, you're risking yourself to take that chance because deep down, you know that if I get to the other side of fear, which is like this incredible experience, you would push a little, a little harder. But it's really, really worth it. Knowing the person's story, owning your story, and coming together to exchange the story and get an understanding for each other without any assumptions. Assumptions will kill everything. So no assumptions here in the story. That's such good advice. You know what? I have never heard it put that way. So how would you recommend, let's say that you have a rocky relationship with somebody that you'd want to make amends or restore that relationship. So you want to get to know their story. How do you, how do you say it in a way without saying, hello, dad, I would like to know your story. <laughs> how do you open it up? Well, it's funny because this, my courageous conversation journey, adventure as I like to call it, started with my own experience with my mother. Um, my mother and I had a very hard relationship and it was, um, we just had, a, we just can communicate our feelings really well. And I remember this summer, just as what we were talking about, I, I went to visit my mom to have this heart to heart. And, you know, I'm going to tell you my feelings and you're going to tell me your feelings and uh, we're going to be better. And when I confronted my mother, like the hello, mom, tell me your story. Um, they're of the generation where they're not open to having those conversations. And so initially, you know, I felt rejected and blown and like, this is never going to happen. And I had a girlfriend of mine's and I went to her and I said, I'm going to have to mourn the loss of this relationship because my mother is not willing to have this conversation with me, this conversation that will change us. But what I didn't know is even though I wasn't successful in the initial I will say confrontational conversation with my mother, <laughs> it planted a seed in her. And mm. after me going through this experience of thinking it's never going to happen, the, 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 the confrontational conversation planted a seed, which initiated a curiosity in her to find out maybe I don't want to talk about the, the, the hurt or the traumatic things of what we've experienced but maybe I want to start again and love you just as we are right here, right now. Mm -hmm. And because I knew a little bit about my mother's story before her telling me all of it, you know, I was able to sort of empathize and says, you know what, I can negotiate right here because sometimes we're not able to know the entire story. A lot of the older generation and even some of us carry shame in our story. There's a lot of um, hurt. There's a lot of things that they're not willing to resurrect. But if we're willing to meet people where they are in those kinds of difficult situations and create a conversation moving forward with an expectation of, I'm going to hear you, you're going to hear me, you can also start and be successful. And I'm happy to say that my mama and I are doing very well. I love that. Yeah. So 
Lynn, do you have any advice for people? Because sometimes you're going to have these conversations and the answer you get is not going to be the answer you would hope for, or you will feel walk away feeling rejected, or you will get the no. How do you maintain your identity and love for yourself when you when you encounter that? Is it understanding that really it's not a rejection about you, it's usually what's going on for that other person? What would your advice be? Yeah, I, I really think there's this thing about intimacy. Into me, do you see? Mm -hmm. So when I'm having a conversation with someone, my question then becomes, do you see me? And the opportunity sometimes doesn't come in the, the heavenly sound of the opening of it, but the opportunity comes is, do you see me? Do you hear me? Do you feel me? And I think the expectation that a big explosion is going to happen, sometimes it's a little bit much. We have to take these things in increments. You know, we start the conversation, we give the person time, we come back to the conversation. It's like a co-piloting kind of a thing. So it's not necessarily, um, you know, we're going to have all of those things right away, but it's really just, you know, having that expectation to say, okay, if they are not ready, I'm still going to be okay with it. Because it's really about you. It's about clearing your air. It's about loving yourself to know that I'm okay with that. They've heard me and I'm okay. I think going into a conversation thinking that it's going to absolutely be resolved and all the answers are going to be answered and you're going to hug and kiss and go to Starbucks, my favorite joint after, it doesn't necessarily work that way. And I think mm -hmm. you have to leave room for those kinds of things. Um, not disappointment, because the fact that you're having the conversation is a huge breakthrough in the relationship, right? Yes. Um, you Good need point. to give it time. It's a process. Some of us ha haven't had these conversations for 20 years, and we go in for 20 minutes, and we expect us to exchange vows at that conversation. It's not going to happen. We don't know where the, where the person is at. So it's really important that we have an expectation for ourselves to say, wow. If it doesn't go the way it's supposed to go, I'm still going to be okay. And if it goes exactly because this person's at a place where they can receive it and we can talk about it, then we're both winning. But no, no one loses when you start the conversation. And I think also it's really important to come into that conversation from a place of already being accepted. That will help you with experiences of getting the answer you don't want to say, you know what? I am already accepted. I am lovable. I am valuable. I am worthy. And just coming into it, into the conversation from a place from acceptance instead of for acceptance yes. is a, such a big difference. Yeah, because we have to, you know, there's this thing where, you know, I, I actually I was having a, a, a courageous conversation with somebody today and they were talking about a relationship they had with somebody else. And they said to me, you know, I don't really need to get involved. I'll just leave the elephant in the room. And so my challenge to this person was, but do you love this individual? And they said, well, I love them. I go, so how would you, why would you be willing to risk a relationship and allow this elephant in the room? I said, go after it, go mm -hmm. after it. I said, because you don't know what that person's carrying. So go after it. And for us, the individual, you have to go after yourself first. You have to kind of say, you know, what role did I play? You know, what am I feeling? You know, all of these questions, it first starts with you. You cannot give anything to anyone if you have not given it to yourself. So you, wow. you have to have that sort of mirrored conversation where you say, you know, I, um, I got to work through some stuff. I got to work through uh, difficult conversations. I got to work through negativity. I got to work through how I hear things. Sometimes somebody can say things and we read a whole body language and we yeah. think to ourselves, Oh my God, that's what they mean. No, no, no. That's what you're interpreting. They didn't say that, but your experience takes you to that interpretation. So you've got to be honest and authentic with yourself. It's kind of like that saying that says you can't love somebody if you don't love yourself. Mm -hmm. You can't be courageous with somebody if you're not courageous with yourself. You have to know that you are worth it for you. And then the bonus is when people come along and just give that affirmation. But it's really about you. And what I have found is the surprising thing. Some of the things that I've shared with my audiences when I speak on stage that I used to think I need to hide this part of who I am. And then I thought, no, I really want to be authentic. So then I started sharing it. Then healing would happen for them because they'd be like, oh, you too? Oh, my goodness. And 
I wasn't rejected at all. It was more, you become more accepted when you become real. Now I, I see that Jill has written and she said, this is what I need for my daughter's big time. And speaking of kids, Lynn, you had a courageous conversation recently yes. with your children. And I know we talked earlier and you said you would share that. So why don't you let, let the listeners know uh, what, what's been going on with you? Yeah. So about a month ago, I was diagnosed with CML, which is a chronic form of leukemia. And, uh, you know, as I was sharing with Denise earlier, um, it, it, you go into panic. Um, I've had all the symptoms. I wasn't paying attention. And it's kind of like life sometimes. There are things within our relationships. There are things with where we work. There are things in dynamics in relationships that we know that are not right. But we're like, oh, I'll fix it tomorrow. So the symptoms started showing up. I had um, marks on my skin, shortness of breath. Um, and the list went on and I'm a mom of three. So I'm busy first and everything else after. And, um, I did some blood work when I saw my doctor rushed to the hospital. And before you know it, I had all of these things, words, doctors being thrown before me. And I, um, it was scary. And then the second scary part is now I had to talk to the kids because mom, why are you in the hospital? Why are you going and taking so many tests? And it was really about opening this forum where they can ask me anything, anything that they were thinking. Um, Mom, are you going to die? Um, Mom, what's the cure looking like? Mom, how available are you going to be? And, you know, I found the more honest I was with them, the easier it became for them to have these conversations, whether it's 11 o'clock in the night or 11 o'clock in the day. And it was really good because there was this rallying around me kind of like, okay, mom, you need to sit down. Uh, uh, part of the disease, it affects my bones. So sometimes I can walk really well. And then sometimes I can. And yeah. no one no one was home the other day. And my daughter had to come and help me walk up the stairs. And she held out her arm. And she's like, mom, let me help you. And, and this is what happens when you make yourself transparent, available, and you have these healthy conversations. So when you are not available in yourself or sicknesses have kind of gotten in your way you're able to bring in the people that you know that loves you and we are always having the conversation because we're i'm in the healing i've gotten the right medication i'm working with a really great team um and so we're working together but i wouldn't have been able to do that if i had decided to keep them out of this conversation or give them the minimum it was really important that i was open and honest and transparent with them yeah, and kids are so intelligent. And if you don't tell them the truth, they'll know it for one thing. Yeah. And the other thing is they'll fill in the missing pieces of information with scary stories and it makes it worse. So sometimes I know as parents, when it comes to having courageous conversations with our kids, we often want to, we think we're protecting them. If we say, no, everything's fine. And then we don't tell them. But I think it gives them more peace and more confidence when you're being completely transparent. Would you agree? Yeah, and it's all at their level. Like I have a 17-year-old, yeah. a 16-year-old, a, 16 a nine-year-old. My nine-year-old knew that, you know, because I can't tell him all of the, the, the cancer word is a really, you know, it's like a death sentence when people hear it. So for my nine-year-old to hear that, there's nowhere I can break that down for him to understand other than he thinks his mother's going to die. So I would mm -hmm. say I have to do some tests. I have to get it done. For the older ones, I explained it to them at their level. And they, they asked me, You froze. Did your own research. But it, it's just, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it's really about. When I said you, you froze, know, I didn't mean your conversation. <laughs> Lynn, when I said uh, you froze, I didn't mean your conversation. For a minute, you just froze. <laughs> so, no, in your conversations, you were doing great. It's just your screen just froze just then. <laughs> and I'm frozen now. I'm frozen. I'm frozen. <laughs> Yeah, so it's really being transparent really opens up the conversation. And it also gives them this, like the highway of freedom yeah. where they can just come and talk to you about how, what they're feeling. And that helps everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's see what we have here. Uh, Alice said, hello, everyone. Wow, something unlocked in me when Lynn just said your experience takes you to that interpretation. Thank you for sharing that golden nugget. That will help me. So since that was such a profound nugget, your experience takes you to that interpretation. Let's talk about that. Do you mean your past experience has you creating these stories around the situation and about the conversation you need to have? 
Exactly. Exactly. You have an experience with someone and you think, well, your assumption is that they're always going to give you that, right? Mm -hmm. So you interpret whatever they do as they're, they're always, but you're not even allowing them the opportunity to show a change behavior. It, it goes back to that assumption. I, you know, they're always, we don't, my husband and I used to get in a fight all the time because I'd always say, you always don't do this. And he would say, always, Lynn. And I go, yes, always. And he goes, always, Lynn. Always means like it never doesn't happen. And I go, yes. oh, okay. So always is a bad example <laughs> of a word. But I say that to say is that you have to give people the opportunity to be redemptive in your presence because you are also looking for that too as well. So it's really, really important that, you know, our experience and our interpretation doesn't take us and take over the conversation. Now, when we're talking about saying what needs to be said, I know one of the hardest things for people to say is, I'm sorry. And it's the fear of rejection again, isn't it? It's to say, because by apologizing in a way we think it's saying, I'm wrong, I made a mistake, I'm admitting it, so now I'm going to be rejected. But that's such a healing phrase to give a true apology. Listen, there is nothing. <laughs> Listen, Lindas. <laughs> there is nothing like a feeling of transitioning to be in a place of affirmation and being present. You know, a lot of the times we can perform a role, so we can be really good about our performance. But what people are really looking for to transition into healing is our presence. Ooh, yeah. So the performance of I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to, the presence of I'm sorry and hands outstretched. Listen, that is more healing than any medicine that we can partake of. So it's it's it may it may be perceived as a, a weakness. But it's actually the wings you really need to fly out in strength. Sorry does that. It gives you these wings that, you know, you ever had a really good conversation? Hey, listen, sorry yeah. helps you soar. There you go, girl. Sorry helps you soar. No, it really, it really is the key to unlock the, the treasure of pain that you've held dear in your heart with your assumptions and interpretation. So be the first one to say, I'm sorry. And then you're not responsible anymore because you're really just putting everything out there. Then you start clothing yourself with good relationships, good boundaries, all these things that are good because you. You froze just a bit. So, everybody down. <laughs> it didn't do that little spinning thing. It was. Just a little bit frozen. I'm so uh, one more question that might help some younger viewers mm -hmm. who are starting out. Some, in a way, it's it's easier, I think, as we get older to be okay with the rejection and accepting ourselves. But for the younger viewers who might even need to be, you know, having a courageous conversation with their boss, that could mean I need to ask for an extra week off per year. I deserve a raise, and here's why I feel like I need a raise. What would you suggest for those individuals? In, in order to have that conversation because sometimes they shy away thinking if I ask that of my boss my boss will get mad and I'll get fired <laughs> well, yes. we know you're not going to get fired you'll just maybe get told no and that's okay <laughs> and yeah and that's the thing and one of the things I worked in HR and I used to be a hiring manager so I used to have these conversations with young people all the time and first to begin once you're doing the work and you are being rewarded and recognized you are supposed and allowed to ask there, there is nothing to be shy or timid about. You are, you, you are punctual. You, you present what needs to be presented. You take full ownership of your work. As a manager, um, sometimes you don't even have to ask. I can notice it and give it to you. But if you're going to have that conversation, you're not going to have that conversation based on, you know, I'm entitled. You're going to ask that conversation based on your summary. So your position mm -hmm. has a summary of what your duties are. You, you go through those things and you have this conversation. And these conversations are ongoing because if you are having coaching relationships with your, co with your boss or your management team, feedback is really, really important. So if somebody's giving you feedback and the feedback is positive and it's going in the right direction, you are building momentum to have that conversation 
So what's my next step? What's the model? What do you, you know, what mentorship programs do I have? How do I get from this place to that place? This is my started income. This is what I've brought to the table. How do we get to the next step? And let's have a conversation. What's important in that conversation for the, for the, the one that's asking the question is to listen. You may get rejected the first time, but listen to the reasons why. Mm, good it's advice. It's really important to listen because those reasons are the ones that you're going to correct and then you're going to go back and you're going to say, listen, uh, this is the feedback that I got. This is where I've raised the bar. So let's revisit that conversation about that raise again. And, you know, the majority of the times it's a, success a successful conversation. That is great because, you know, I, I know that... Uh, in the past, when I was in my 20s and I was working for a company, I would be so afraid of the boss and to say what's true. You might need a mental health day because you're completely overwhelmed mm -hmm. and you need to have a day off. But instead, you call in and say, oh, I have a cold and the flu. So we tell a lie yeah. to not get rejected and that lie will affect you. Oh, it will. It will. It will. And it, honesty is the best policy. You know, we've been hearing that from since Adam was a boy. And um, it really, really is the best policy. Sometimes it doesn't work right away because there are some people, their life experience, things that everybody's telling a lie. They think everybody's out to get them. Um, and so that's sometimes where it becomes a challenge. But your consistency is really what's going to bring your breakthrough, whether it's in an ink, uh, a raise, a mental health day, a relationship, your consistency it, and your reliability and dependent and your ownership is really is what's going to bring about the change in any aspect of your life. I love how you keep going back to t the stories that we tell ourselves, because those are the stories that create the fear and hold us back. And you're talking about challenging your assumptions. And one of the things that I teach people in my courses is when they're challenging their assumptions to ask, is the thought I'm hearing from someone else, so something, somebody saying something about me, positive, negative, whatever the case may be, is the thought I'm hearing or the thought I have myself a fact or an opinion? Yeah. And more often than not, it's just an opinion. And when we can say, wait a minute, I'm hearing something that I'm perceiving as negative. So I've got my story circling around it. Ask mm -hmm. yourself, okay, wait, <laughs> is this story a fact or an opinion? Mm -hmm. And don't let your life be led by opinions. <laughs> yeah. Go with the facts. And, and we have this thing, you know, I talk to myself a lot. So if you see me driving my car, it's not my picture. <laughs> Only the audience here know that, right? So we're not going to get that outside of this forum. Um, and because I'm always having this conversation with myself, because I think it's really important. You know, we spend time getting to know people. We invest time in people. We invest time in organizations. We invest time in doing all the things that's outside of us. But we don't think it's important to invest the time inside. Ask, challenge yourself. You know, why do you always act that way when somebody says something? What's really the undercurrent? Right. Brianna saying the something. Undercurrent is that that person makes me feel insecure. And you're like, oh. Go ahead, Brianna. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Brianna saying that uh, the difference between fact and opinion has always been such a fine line for me. I, I guess when the stories get really intertwined, it's hard to see the difference. So that's actually a really good point. Now, Lynn, we only have two minutes left. The seven, the 30 minutes has just zipped by. Oh, wow. What would you say is one of the benefits of getting that courageous conversation out there? So you feel the fear and you speak up anyway. So what is the biggest benefit or the rewards that you see? It's really, it, the biggest benefit is changing from a fear uh, position to an understanding position. Yeah. And when we understand things better, and it, it's kind of like a math problem. If you have an understanding and you can break down and you can answer that, listen, you're winning. So life is like that. It's about winning in the conversation and breaking it down. So it's definitely worth it to have the, the, the courageous conversation. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. I just love you. I think you're amazing. And the wisdom you imparted tonight, oh man, it's going to be opening doors. And I hope all of our viewers are getting ready.